So, so I ran into a problem recently. My homebrew collection's getting real small. But I think I got a solution. Yeast. This is the first episode in a series on how I store yeast cultures and use them to brew. I've been building my collection of yeast over the past few years. And in this episode, you'll learn how I culture and store them. Kept in the fridge, these cultures can last many, many, many years. The next episode will cover creating a yeast starter with it and starting a brew. The final episode will be post-processing and bottling your brew. I start by preparing some agar. I boil a standard malt extract recipe. I then transfer it to a jar to make it easier to transfer to these small containers. I use these containers to make slants. Slants are often used to store biologics for long periods, such as fungus or molds. By filling each one with 5 milliliters of agar, then letting them cool in this 3D printed stand, it creates the perfect surface to grow microbes on. Once all the jars are filled, they are not sterile, so they have to be pressure cooked in order to sterilize them. To do this, I loosen the lids as much as possible without them falling off, and I put them all in a jar that also has a loose, turned upside down lid. I pressure cook at 15 psi for 10 to 15 minutes. Liquids sterilize very quickly, so it doesn't have to be a long time. When they reach a temperature that I can kind of handle, I retighten the lids and put them in the 3D printed stand to cool. The temperature of the small jars at this point was 165 degrees. You could let them cool a little more if you want, but this helps prevent contamination if you do it hot. From here, I just let them cool off until the agar completely solidifies. I also took some of the extra agar that I pressure cooked and made some petri dishes because we'll be needing those. I did all of this work in my still air box and if you don't know what that is, check out my video explaining them. Next, we need to give our yeast a home. Yeast like to eat sugar and they can do it in one of two ways. They can do it aerobically or anaerobically, that means with or without oxygen. But in both cases they eat sugar. I will be preparing what's known as a wart. If you're making beer or a grain spirit, it's known as a must. After preparing roughly 500 milliliters of water, I add 30 grams of honey to it and check the specific gravity. Specific gravity is a measurement of the density of a liquid. And in this case, I'm measuring how much dissolved sugar is in the water. I'm aiming for a specific gravity of 1.06 because that's the standard gravity used in a yeast starter. To check the gravity, I transfer roughly 100 milliliters of wort to this graduated cylinder. Once that's completed, I get my triple scale hydrometer. I will only be focusing on the specific gravity measurement, but triple scale hydrometers also give bricks measurements and projected alcohol percentage. After floating the hydrometer, I noticed that the specific gravity is 1.02, which means that I need to add more sugar. I start by adding 40 grams, which wasn't enough, so I add another 20, and then another 15, which finally got me to the specific gravity that I was looking for. Once I'm confident that the specific gravity is 1.06 and all of the honey is dissolved, I will start transferring 10 milliliters of wort into these small flasks. These flasks will have two uses. The first will be isolating yeast from commercial packages, and the second will be propagating and expanding your yeast culture when creating a starter from your storage. Yeast starters are very important if you keep your own cultures. It allows you to increase the cell count to a point where the yeast can outcompete any other organisms. Unlike mycology, brewing is not a sterile art form. It's important to be very sanitary, but sterility is not required. 
This is because the yeast can outcompete and outgrow almost any other microbe that could be present in small quantities inside of your brew. This is only possible if you have enough yeast cells to start with, which is why we need to slowly propagate them over time to create a starter. Once the vials are filled, I loosen the lids and pressure cook everything to ensure that they're sterile. That's because at this stage, sterility is still very important as we're trying to isolate single cell colonies. If you don't want to deal with all this sterile procedure, you can buy a yeast packet from a commercial vendor. And that is an effective way to ferment your own alcohol, but I find it a lot more fun to culture and store your own yeast. Just like before, I pressure cook at 15 psi for 10 to 15 minutes. Now it's time for a yeast party. I move everything to my still air box and I get three packs of sterile swabs along with three petri dishes. You might notice some sediment in the honey from the pressure cooking process, but this isn't a problem. After gingerly opening the commercial yeast packet, I unscrew the lid and leave it loose. That way I can open the container with one hand while dumping the yeast in with the other. I did my best to get a really small amount of yeast in, but I ended up getting more than I wanted. This won't be a problem though. Depending on the yeast you use, after shaking it, you may still see some yeast pellets floating around. I re-sanitize my hands and then grab the petri dishes. After that, I open up a sterile swab and dip it into the solution we just made. I will be utilizing a technique called streaking where I can isolate individual yeast cells. I have a technique involving two sterile swabs that gives me really good results. I start by streaking the swab I just dipped in a small segment on the side of the petri dish. After that, I grab a new swab from the package and I streak over and out from the area, creating a new streak pattern on another third of the petri dish. Then I rotate the swab 90 degrees and I finish streaking the entire disc. What this does is it isolates individual cells by slowly diluting them over the streaks. I start by making a dense area of cells. Then taking another swab, I grab a few of them from that area and create a less dense area of cells. Then rotating the swab, I grab a little bit out of that area and create an even less dense area of cells. Here's a visual example of what I mean by that. First I make the dense area, then I would switch swabs, drag from that to create a less dense area, and then finally drag from that area and fill out the middle. This is the pattern that I've come to use, but there's plenty of different streak patterns that are all effective. I finished streaking the last plate, just so I have a big selection to choose from. Then, we have to wait about 24 hours for the cell cultures to show up. 24 hours later, I noticed that the growth wasn't enough for me, so I gave it another day. Here's 48 hours in. Notice that some of the streaks are high density, while others have low density. That's just because I'm bad at streaking. I identify a couple individual colonies. I carefully pick one of them out of the dish and streak it onto a fresh dish. You'll notice that I use a different streaking pattern for this because the cell density is much lower. Basically, I go back and forth across the whole plate while rotating the swab. I repeat that two more times and I let those new plates sit a while to grow out. After around 48 hours, I see some nice growth on the plates. Yeast should present as creamy and white and should not have any colors in it. These are some great examples of what healthy yeast should look like. I sanitize my hands, grab some swabs, and the slants that we'll be transferring yeast into. Removing a sterile swab from the package, I use it to gather a good quantity of healthy yeast cells from the plate. You can see a bit of mold in the corner that got in there during the transfer process, but it's not a problem. It's not on the yeast. 
I then thoroughly coat the entire surface of the slant with yeast, making sure I don't miss any spots. This will allow the yeast to establish a healthy dominant colony inside of your slant, just in case any potential contamination gets in. I repeat this entire process one more time to create two slants. I like to have backups of all of my genetics in storage in case a problem occurs. I store these in the fridge inside of a plastic bag, and I've used cultures that are over five years old with no problem. I let them sit at room temperature for around two days to grow out. Then I'll just store them in the fridge for when I'm ready to use them. As always, thanks for watching my video and I appreciate all your support, especially my Patreon supporters. Make sure you subscribe so you can see part two, where we use these yeast cultures to make a wine.